Hey, everyone. Welcome to No Reserve, part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. We're here to help you make sense of the enthusiast car market, whether you're buying, selling, or simply watching. This week, we've got a forgotten Acura, a car that just won't die, a baller Benz, an Aston Martin that James Bond wouldn't touch, and a $6,000 Porsche. I'm Larry Webster, editor of Haggerty Media. And I'm Dave Kinney, publisher of the Haggerty Price Guide. All right, between the two of us, we've got decades of experience buying, selling, and driving the cars we love. Plus, we're backed up by the data of the Haggerty Valuation Tools. Dave, you ready to roll? Hey, Larry, let's do this thing. Okay, we're recording this on Wednesday, November 2nd. Um, It's been an interesting week with a lot of crazy sales. Let's jump right into our opening bid segment. Uh, Dave, what are you seeing? What did you notice this past week? Oh, man, we got everything from the cheap to the really expensive here. But uh, I I got a question for you. Name a car company that starts Mm -hmm. with A Mm -mm. that in the past or presently sells a five-cylinder engine. Audi. Duh. There you go. Except for, did you know Acura sold a five-cylinder car? Yes, you're talking about. I know exactly the car you're talking about. Go ahead. The Vigor. Acura Vigor. Probably kind of one of the weirdest names ever, but uh, not a uh, not what you think it is. Uh, it's an inline five cylinder. Uh, they were built from uh, or they were sold in the U.S. Uh, as Acuras from ninety one to ninety four. Um, they were not exactly an up upscale Accord. I think a lot of people said that, but uh, there. So the lineup was the Integra at the bottom, the Vigor in the middle, and the Legend uh, was the the car that uh, you know you wanted. Yeah. And the Vigor yeah. was replaced by the TL, a much better known uh, Acura. So anyhow, there was one of these that sold at Chicago at the Meekum auction for a whopping $3,300. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't automatic, but it's the GS, which is the Highline version. So if you're buying a Vigor, you want the, uh, you want the Highline. That but, was well sold. Well sold. I mean, this car had a lot of miles on it, right? 170,000 ish. Yeah, something like that. And uh, I, I guess it's kind of one of those things that uh, you know maybe Acura would would uh, not want to buy back, but somebody who is a you know huge Acura collector might want to have oh. uh, have something to complete the set, right? I remember driving these things. They're super cool um, because you know back in the early 90s when Honda and Acura were still spending tons of money developing their cars, this thing was refined. Yep. It had a, it was really uh well done inside. You know, it had little wood touches, it had frameless doors. And I think the name was weird, Vigor. And to your point, it was like it kind of looked like a legend. So you're like, wait, what's the difference? A legend or a vigor? Yeah, the, oh, the, the difference was five grand apparently when they yeah. were new. So that was the difference. And you got more with the legend. So I think that uh, kind of made, I think they sold like eleven of them, you know, maybe twenty three. <laughs> you know, just kidding. I really don't yeah. know, but they didn't sell a lot. Well, uh, I can tell you from experience, like I just was, uh, you know, I, I refurbished a four wheel steering prelude, which is right about the same era. Right. And, and the parts for that were hard. I can't imagine <laughs> finding parts for this thing. So, and this one, a longitudinal engine with a 35 yeah. degree slant. So, I mean, it's kind of a, you know, an engineer's special, I guess, but hey, $3,300, you get a collector car, you take it to cars and coffee. You will be the only one there guaranteed. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those when something big happens, you just leave it and you call your friend to pick you up. <laughs> <laughs> take take the tags off, leave it on the side of the yes, road, right? Tags off and run. All right. Well, yeah, totally cool car. You haven't seen it in a while. Uh, the thing that that uh, I was pretty interested in was another first gen Miata. Yeah. That sold at Barrett Jackson, and and you know, just the week before we talked about one that sold to Bring a Trailer for twelve thousand bucks, and I think it had like twenty thousand miles. And holy smoke, what a great! value that was and this one is very similar to that but it was in white not the very common red this barrett jackson car right and it sold for 27.5 and i i'm just floored at the discrepancy there i mean something must have happened somebody was drinking at the auction you think i don't know it's a part of the uh, i got a confession for you it's part of the tyler hoover collection and so little innocent me i didn't realize that's hoovy uh, you know, YouTube star, Hoovy's Garage, you know, all that sort of stuff. Who, by the way, it, and go listen to him sometime. He sounds exactly like a 30-year-old uh, Mr. Howell from Gilligan's Island. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the guy's voice is very distinctive. But anyhow, uh, uh, yeah, this thing brought all the money. Uh, it's got a 2022 service and an oil change and a timing belt and a water pump. But other than that, it's kind of, uh, you know, this is uh, what we what we call well-sold, I guess, right? It totally was, um, you know, and 
we've talked about this before, like the, the value of a celebrity owned car. And, you know, if you look at the big celebrities, Steve McQueen and uh, maybe Burt Reynolds, I think I've heard from you and the other valuation experts, Dave, it's like maybe 20%. Uh, depending. I mean, there's always kinds of, it's a hard thing, but this is, seems like a huge premium for a Hoovy car. So yeah. I mean, and Hoovy, how do I put it nicely is uh, famous for hoopty. So, uh, you know, he's got a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of cars. Uh, there's some very nice cars in this collection. This was not a hoopty by any stretch of the imagination, but no. I don't think there's really any celebrity ad. It's more of a very interesting thing, I guess. But, uh, yeah, you know, we have these in the price guide, uh, number one at 29.8, and that's very close to where it sold because it got uh, 27.5. So by the time you drag it home and pay taxes, you're going to have 29.8 and then anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. And this, this looked like, uh, you know, in that guide, one to five. One is it just left the showroom, essentially. So there's like two or three cars in the country that are number one condition, right? Well, not with then, the, even, even with the very low miles on this one. This one couldn't, uh, well, could possibly be, but somebody had to spend 60 grand to make it into a number one. That's my point. It's yeah. not a number one car. Nope. So it's nope. probably more like in the condition range. Somewhere in the low two, maybe a high threes, which is uh, makes it worth in the high teens, really, typically, right? Yeah, but, uh, you know, if it's there, if it's the color you want, all that sort of stuff. I mean, you know, when you're talking about it, yes, it's a third more, which is a lot of money. But for a lot of people, 10 grand isn't all that much more if it's the one they want. So that's, oh. the, that's the way the world works, Larry. I yeah, mean, okay. you and I know about buying high and selling low. There's other people who <laughs> buy high and keep it. So... Uh, yeah. Well, it's really, I, I've been thinking about that $12,000 one that sold. And uh, let me just make an announcement. Anybody has a silver first gen, really, really clean Miata, <laughs> call me. I'm interested. The prices are really good. Okay. What, do, what, do, what they have to, do they have to go through your uh, probation officer to call you? Or, I mean, you have the direct <laughs> line back now. Uh, that's classified, Dave. No, okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Hey, uh, how about an 84 uh, BMW Alpina uh, B6 2.8 liter? Quite a car. Oh, I like E30s, which is what this generation's called. What do you mean? What do you like about it? Well, I mean, it's an Alpina, so it's got the speed equipment. It's kind of, uh, it, it's kind of like, you know, take an E30 and put it on steroids, and you know, uh, take it through the time warp machine and do all the right stuff to it, and you get to a hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars on uh, bring a trailer with this car, which is an astounding amount in some ways. And kind of very sensible in other ways. It's quite a car. Uh, they made 261 of these apparently in the uh, uh, you know in the run, and this is the 71st two year production run. Um, so good history on the car. It looks like a uh, lot of money. Um, again, I guess there's a you know there's a car for everyone. This would not be my first spend 175 grand, but I get the reason why. Well, it's 10,000 miles, so it's brand new. And you know the history of Alpina. Um, maybe you could correct my my what I'm going to say here. This was the company that turned 2002s into race winners. Oh and yeah, some of the most famous iconic uh, 2002 race cars in the under 2.5 liter class in Trans Am were Alpina cars. Yeah, the short. So that's where that name means so much, right? Yeah, the shorthand is this is the AMG of uh, BMW. Yeah. It's totally not. Don't you know? Don't write. Don't call. I mean, it's completely different in so many ways. But it's it's basically their tuner, their speed cars. You know, their uh, kind of. Oh, you've got extra money to spend. Let's take you over to the Alpina book and show you that. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's how this happened. Uh, but, uh, you know, quite a car, uh, congratulations to the buyer and seller. I think this thing's got more room in it in the next few years. Um, but it's a lot of money to get into one of these things. So, well, it combines two things in my view. Um, one is the Alpina name, yep. the rarity. There does seem to be quite a bunch of, uh, you know, trim. It's very basically, uh, obviously an Alpina. But also, it has no miles. That's 10,000 kilometers. On yeah, it. yeah. Which so it's, is, it's also a wrapper car, essentially, yeah. which is. You're talking W R A P P E R, not R A P P E R, right? So uh, yeah, there's a difference. Yes, in the wrapper <laughs> as opposed to with a wrapper. So uh, yeah, exactly. right. It's like those. Uh, you've seen those videos of uh, you know you can still buy like forty brand new forty year old mo motorcycles that are in the shipping crate. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I am have to admit, I I do fall prey to watching those YouTube videos of them ungrading this totally uh, crazy but plain motorcycle, but. You know, it's it, this is a hard one for me. Uh, it's a real collector kind of car because you know, think about an E30 M3, which is flared fenders, hot rod version of the thing. Those are still in the 
between fifty and a hundred, I think. So Oh, you can spend more. Don't worry. No, there's you there's can. plenty of ways you can spend more on one of those. But yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay. It's the ultimate. So I mean, you know, you pay more to get more. And uh in this case you actually do. Okay, let's go back to then uh, here's crazy price, great I mean, I don't mean crazy like somebody really got a good car, but it costs a lot to uh, a really fun car for not a lot. And it's a, these, uh, it's a 99 Porsche Boxster, first generation Boxster. These things, um, they're like the Miata of the Porsche world. And yeah. it's sold right at uh, Chicago, the Meekin auction for, what was it? 6,600 bucks. 6,600 I mean, And it looks nice. You notice that I had a car for 3,300 and a car for 6,600, both from Meekum. That's kind of weird. Uh, but yeah, uh-huh. I mean, you know, look, okay, it's probably got problems. There's no doubt about it, but it's a Porsche. And it's a five-speed, and it says that it's a southern car, which in Chicago should be a big deal because, uh, you know, Chicago's not the home to rust, but it grew up there. So, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of it's rust where there. where it flourishes, for yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. So, and it's maroon with gray leather, which is a good color combination. I'm not so hot on gray leather, but I like the maroon color. Um, there's a lot of fun to be had for somebody who can tinker a little bit uh, and, you know, get a Porsche. I mean, yeah, these cars were cheap when they were new. Uh, you know, compared to what they cost now, that's for darn sure. But uh, you know, you can you can roll around saying, "Yeah, I got a Porsche and paid sixty six hundred dollars for it." However, I'm going to say it again: the sixty six hundred was the down payment on owning this car. So, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. You know, it, it, there's two camps of thought on these boxers, right? Either it's the first one is like, "Oh, does it have an IMS bearing?" And that was the the flawed part in the motor that almost all of them need to be replaced. But they sound really good. They've got that snorty flat six motor. Yep. The paint on this one is nice. The interior looks, the, it has seat covers on it, which means Replaced. you don't really know yeah. what's underneath them. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, but the dash, usually that's the weak spot of these cars is the cheap materials they used on the dash. I mean, this is a ton of car for the money. And I think there's such a big support for the club to keep them running. Yep. I, I don't think there's a lot of downside here at all. Yeah, and and keep in mind that some dude with a 2017 911 is at the dealership as we speak right now, and uh, the the <laughs> bill for changing his oil filter, uh, his air filter, and his cabin filter comes to sixty six hundred dollars <laughs> or somewhere around there. So you know, uh, from that standpoint, you can own a Porsche for what somebody's paying in maintenance today. Um, and, you know, and you're right. And the other thing is, I'd say the IMS bearing thing is kind of overblown. They've replaced most of them. They don't all go bad. There's different series, but you know, IMS, 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 it, it gets tiring after a while, but yeah, I know it, it's a great forum topic, but they're, these are brilliant cars to drive. Yep. And in, in difference to a Miata, they have power top. So assuming it works, yeah. it's a really clever top the way it folds. It's one of those things you can pop up and down. It's got one handle in the center of the, the header instead of two like the Miata. So yeah, I, I mean, I know I want, I'm pining for a silver first gen Miata. I think I'd like one of these as well. Maybe we'll put this on the list. What else, Dave? Tell me. Oh, I don't know. How about a uh, 1700 mile 89 Ford Mustang LX 5 liter notchback five speed that sold on bring a trailer for fifty six thousand dollars i wonder what the original no, it didn't sell oh i'm sorry you're right bid to oh good call uh bid to fifty six thousand i wonder what the guy was thinking when he turned down fifty six thousand dollars that's just me but i mean think about it this is not a 17 mile car it's a 1700 mile car it's still in the wrapper it's still a very very nice car i get it's that clean 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 good colors all that sort of stuff but for a fox body to turn down fifty six thousand yikes but dave you know. this is great news this means my 86 box body with hail damage and fifty five thousand miles it's worth at least thirty eight thousand dollars dave don't tell me different uh you said thirty eight hundred dollars is that what you're saying thirty eight thousand thousand oh uh no no larry i you know let's just be honest here um uh, you need to see a therapist if you think it's worth thirty eight thousand. <laughs> but uh not an automotive therapist either uh not a mechanic but hey Let, okay let me make the case for the Fox body. I agree. This is this uh this is a pretty strong price. And the owner maybe wish he or she should have taken it in the coming months. But my Fox body we got a year ago. I've really come to love the thing. They're great. It's kind of crude, but they're light. The motor has got a lot of noise and low end torque. And we've got the tall like rear end where we don't even need any gear higher than third. So once we change that, I think it'll be really snappy. And um they're Really cool, but there you know the story. These things were so easy to modify, <laughs> and they were cheap for so long mm-hmm. that they're all 
speed to nothing. <clears throat> yeah, um, and so uh, and time you know, time and rust was not uh, not the uh, Mustang's friend. That's for sure. No, and then you add in the notchback, which is lighter than the hatchback, is the one everybody wants. So, pretty interesting car. You know, I this is one of those I'd love to know the story. Like, who bought it and parked it? Was that on purpose? You see the window sticker on it? Did yeah. they ever take the window sticker off? No, like, window you know sticker's I mean? still on. Yeah, I know. They they bought it as an investment, or they they have well, and and it was. I mean, what could a list been on a uh, eighty nine Mustang? Thirteen thousand dollars. Yeah, I think right you're right. It, right, I think yeah. you're right. So, uh, you know, that's quite a quite a return on your money. Uh, you had to, you know, he had to not drive it for quite some time. I get that. You know, we have at the price guide, we have a number one topping out at thirty five nine. So add 20 grand to it. And that's what this guy turned down. Maybe he'll, you know, he'll be proven right. Maybe we were wrong, but I think that's awful strong money for a, um, you know, for a, uh, an 89 Mustang, no matter how nice it is. But I'm sure that time will uh, change that. And at some point it'll seem cheap. Well, Dave, will this help you reset that price for the Mustang? Grasshopper. One <laughs> sale does not make a change. <laughs> Whereas two and three can, so I mean, one one sale is an anomaly, and uh, you know, so we wanted it. So even we try a and sale, watch it. Though. Yeah, it's well, it could have been. I mean, had the uh, you know had the owner press the uh, yes, I'll sell it button. Um, but uh, he's even got the original Gator backs on the thing. I mean, those are cool tires. Oh yeah, everybody wants what twenty uh, three year old tires on their car. Yeah, sure, it's a great idea. Yeah, well, I, I was surprised that that didn't sell but what a neat thing the one uh that really caught my eye another one i'll bring a trailer was a, a mosler mt900 i gotta give you a little backstory on this one okay um warren mosler really interesting guy he started a company mosler automotive in the 80s he sold kits for i think rabbits and volkswagen golfs turbo kits mm -hmm. and then he started building his own cars and the first car was this thing called the consulier and remember it, it well car yeah, it, I drove a ton of these things when I was a car and driver. They it has a fiberglass tub, a Chrysler 2.2 liter turbo powertrain, and he met all the production requirements from NHTSA, from the federal government. And the problem was they were just really hard to look at. Oh boy, were and, they ever. The consulier was like, oh my God, what were they thinking? Right. And then they made later versions where they put V8s in them. They uh they had a version with a split window or a split windshield that was kind of like a Captain Nemo looking thing called the Raptor, totally cool. But then uh, in the early two thousands, uh, Mosler got serious and he hired a designer. Mm -hmm. He hired an interior designer and he built this thing called the MT nine hundred, and it was a freaking brilliant car all around. Drove really well, gorgeous looking thing. They raced them successfully in sports car racing in Europe, and I remember driving one at the Car and Driver Lightning Lab. It had a, like an LS7 engine in it. it. I think it won that year. It was crazy, crazy fast and easy to drive. Too. And for, So this one sold. Well, no, ahead. I was just going to say, for as ugly as the consoleers were, this car is that beautiful. I mean, it's a good-looking yeah. car. Uh, really, really Gorgeous. is. Yeah, with Chevy V8 power. Mm -hmm. This one, I, I, I am still sort of intrigued by this price. A modified one with a twin turbo. So this is a one-off. Was sold for two hundred ninety four thousand on Bring a Trailer. Um, this did surprise me. Yep. I mean, that's like Ferrari four fifty eight money. That's uh, new Dino two ninety six money. Yep. I mean, that's strong price. What's your yeah, take? Yeah, and sold by a dealer. Uh, how come most of these things are out of Fort Lauderdale? I, I keep seeing them. Well, that's where they're they're built. I for. know, but I mean, they still they they must have just hung around there and not gone too far. So let me give you some of the uh, specs on this one: six hundred eighty one miles. Like you said, seven liter. Uh, LS7 V8, twin turbochargers, carbon fiber covers, Porsche, six-speed manual transmission, metallic green paint, tan upholstery. I mean, it is a cool-looking car. And I guess, you know, if you want one of these, this is the one to have. So, uh, you know, somebody paid a lot and got a lot in this particular case. Kind of hard to put a number on it for me to say, you know, that's a great price or a bad price, but it seems reasonable for what you're getting in some ways. Reasonable? Yeah. I don't know, man. What, what you're getting you, a brand. You're, you're operating a, in stratosphere. A, that's a not brand mine. new, a brand new, one of a kind great race car. So uh, you know, uh, look, I'm talking reasonable to a billionaire. You know, so that uh, I guess maybe that's a pretty short market. This is like McLaren 720 money. Yeah, yeah. And your point is, okay. 
I have no. Okay. Point. Well, no. But, the, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's Warren, got it, it's it's got an LS, man. I mean, you know, it's ready to it's ready to go down to Napa to get parts for it. I tell you what, Not I really. would love to have a console here, uh, just because I I spent a lot of time with Warren Mosler, and and he is, I thought he just was a, a really good human. You know, and and uh, those cars guy, were dominating yeah. tracks at the time too. I mean, they were yeah, really they were. doing well. I mean, they were like a, you know one of yeah. those things that was like they came from nowhere, they showed up, and and you get. Uh, Guys who you know literally had their first, second, or third track experience, and they were they were competitive in the car. It was a hell of a car. Yeah, they won this race. There was this famous race at uh, Nelson Ledges in Eastern Ohio called the Longest Day. It was a twenty four hour race on the that was always held the weekend after uh, the the beginning of summer. What was that called? The Equinox? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like that day? yeah. All right, whatever. Vernal Equinox. And they always won. Right. Back then, you know, the, the production cars would eat up their brakes, eat up their tires. And, you know, Warren's Consolier was light and uh, fast and low to the ground. If So, yeah, great cars, kind of a great piece of United States automotive history. And uh, I hope the new owner certainly enjoys it. OK, we got time for one more. What? Let's talk about this uh, um, luxury on a budget, maybe, is a good one. Do you see that? The, <laughs> you see the. Uh, um, I don't know what to make of these uh, late '90s Aston Martins, and I feel so bad. Aston Martin's such a story brand, you know. DB5s are one and two million dollar cars. James Bond drove them, and then I don't know. At some point, they Ford owned Aston Martin and Jaguar. They were sharing all these parts, and now the DB7 from 1997, you can one sold for thirteen thousand dollars on eBay. Yeah, twelve thousand seven hundred. Even it's even less than our number four, which is fifteen <laughs> four. So uh, it does have some needs. It's sold by a dealer in Chicago. What could possibly go wrong? Um, and uh, there, uh, you know, it's got ninety five thousand miles. It is a left hand drive, thank goodness. Um, but yeah, I guess it is really, uh, you know, a British luxury on a budget, which is scary. Uh, a very scary sentence in and of itself. Uh, it's. Uh, listed with a bunch of needs, the uh, the owner thankfully put down the good news, the bad news, and the okay news, and uh, so we know a little bit about it. But it's um, uh, you know, if for the right guy, this is the right guy, right gal, whoever. This is the right car, but it's just kind of like a <laughs> spoken like a true dealer. Yeah, Dave. I know. I'm telling you. Sorry. What can I say? Um, bring your title, bring your wife down to Trading Dave's. So uh, anyhow, uh, long story short, uh, it's listed in fair condition. It might be less than fair condition, but uh, hey, for a parts car, it's unbelievable. Those uh, 12.7 probably wouldn't buy the wheels new from Aston Martin. I could almost guarantee it. Uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, there's, you know, there's hope in some things. It's a true supercharged inline six, uh, but it's a I real know. live Aston Martin, man. I know where these are going to go. Like these kind of cars are making careers for a bunch of YouTubers, right? Oh yeah. Cause they buy yeah. them, they buy the cheap exotic yeah. car. And then the first episode is I got a $50,000 bill for my $10,000 Aston. And that's kind of what this thing probably has coming to it. Yeah. You're probably right. I mean, that's uh, you're sadly, that's what happens to these cars. And then, uh, then they wind up somewhere uh, by the side of the road with the license plates taken off. So, and then and then somebody comes along and they say, "Wow, I went to a sheriff's sale and I bought an Aston Martin and it only cost me twenty grand." So you know whatever. Yeah, I sold the car. I sold a suburban once, Dave, and uh, I had a trade. I had a I had a delivered to the guy in a parking lot. This was like a fifteen hundred dollars <laughs> suburban. It had rust on and everything like that. And they and the, and the buyer like pulled out twenties and he counted them on the hood and it was pitch black and it was middle winter here in michigan and i remember thinking like i probably should have brought somebody with me on this deal but anyway the truck went away and then 10 months later i got a call from the city and said come get your truck i was like what do you mean come get my truck and they're like well somebody it was left on the side of the road over here and it's broken down and i was thinking like yeah i don't want to touch that thing with him (laughs) it's not my truck so i think i learned sometimes people buy them drive them and don't register them yeah, that's uh, that's kind of right? dangerous stuff. I mean, uh, it's uh, you know, flipping a car without a uh, without you know putting a name, title in your name and stuff like that is something only dealers are allowed to do in most instances. But yeah, if you're the last guy who owned the car um, and they didn't register it, and you know, I, not too many places you can get away with driving without plates, but there are certainly places that people do it, and um, that's not a good thing when that happens. So yeah, you can't. It's, it, there's a name. It's called yeah, title exactly, skipping, right? Exactly. So. Um, yeah, not a good, yeah. not a good deal. All right, well, well, 
Let's move on to kicking tires. This is the section where we talk about auctions that are are still live as we record this. And and you highlighted one, uh, very strange car in my view, but it is iconic. I'm not sure the design has come back. This this Mercedes Benz. Tell us what you like about it. What is it? Well, you know, I'm an AMG guy. Never owned one. Always wanted one. <clears throat> this is a 560 SEC 6.0 AMG wide body, and that's important. Uh, AMG, of course, the uh, at the time an independent, uh, you know, uh, tuner for uh, uh, Mercedes Benz. This was uh, now they're in house. Uh, this car is out of California originally, uh, and sold through their Beverly Hills uh, side of uh, you know from Beverly Hills Motor Accessories. As a matter of fact, this thing's black with uh, anthracite leather. Um, a really, really, really cool car. It's currently listed at fifty-eight thousand dollars on Mercedes Benz Market, the MB Market uh, website. Uh, they have auctions going all the time. They kind of specialize in Mercedes, but not all their cars are Mercedes. Yeah, this is uh, their auction lot fifteen seventy, which I think uh, numbers you should play in the lottery tonight because uh, you know why not win a billion dollars and tell people what you really think of them, right? Well, uh, yeah, I, I'm with you on this car. It's super cool. I mean, it looks like in the black paint and the flared fenders and the and the black and silver wheels, it looks like something a gangster would drive. I mean, yeah, it looks I mean, menacing and mean. It's super cool. You would own Radwood with this car. You wouldn't be just a uh, just a superstar. You'd be an ultra star. Uh, you know, if you showed up with this, because this was you know kind of the car you'd have if you had all the money in the world. You were a stockbroker. Something like that, or maybe in some sort of illicit business. No, no, you had a Countach. You didn't have one of these. This was no, this was this, the this was the partner lawyer in New York. You were a stockbroker with an AMG. Seriously, I think more the partner lawyer in uh, Beverly Hills. How's that? You know, representing some stars or something like that. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it was you know, it was a baller car back in the day, yeah, and I think it's a baller it. car now. So this is probably a two hundred grand car or more, right? Yep, no, I'm sure. Uh, look, we have a number one for the uh, non AMG at one hundred and seven thousand. Uh, that goes way down really fast to fifteen thousand six hundred for a number four. So there's a a ninety five thousand dollar delta between the the best in the world and kind of a uh, an okay driver. And that's not for an AMG car. Let's just say that again. But uh, yeah, they're complicated. They're Mercedes. Uh, they cost a lot to uh, keep on the road most of the time. And parts are going to be a little tough for some of the AMG stuff, but wow, what a car. Yeah, uh, it's I, a clean one. Tell me all the bad reasons I shouldn't have it, and I'll still I say I got it. none. I think you sell all those those crazy Bentleys you have and buy this. I think it's <laughs> okay. much better. Um, yeah, okay. The one, that, the one that I'm looking at that's way more my speed, I love these franking cars. It's a 69 Datsun 510 station wagon with a five-speed out of a 280ZX. It's, it's for sale. I'm bringing a trailer right now. It's right now at 12000 bucks with six days to go. So this might... It's probably already out of my price range, but I, I love when somebody's done tasteful upgrades to a vintage car because it typically lowers the price compared to something that's an original and you get all the fun and maybe a little better functionality. Um, these are great little cars. As you know, they raced them. They did all kinds of things. So I like these things. Yeah, it's currently hanging out between our unmodified number two and number three price. So 10, 10 one for our number three, our number two, seventeen nine. Um, I like this car too because of the clean factor. This thing looks like a uh, pretty much a stock car on the outside, with the exception of the wheels, obviously. But uh, you know, it's a it's a long roof, so it's got that going for it. It's an actual sixty nine Datsun. Uh, it's got a two eighty ZX five speed in it, uh, oversized pistons. Weber carbs, uh, Koenig wheels, uh, ground control, coilover suspension, rear lowering blocks, uh, rebuilt front well, disc brakes. Do you all like this, this all car, the fun Dave? Stuff. What, what would you tell somebody? Well, not to buy it, but mostly I like it. So Why would you tell them not to buy it? <laughs> no, I mean, it's a specialty car. You'll have a lot of fun with it, but uh, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with owning this car. I don't think it's got either of these Recaro seats in it, it looks like. I mean, yeah. it's got it's got a lot of cool stuff to it. So. Um, I, but it is a, you know, it's a Franken car, but it's not an outrageous Franken car. Well, this is one of those where it, the advice I would give is you're going to be buying the owner, not the car. This could yep. go one of two ways. Either you're buying somebody's project that they got sick of fixing and it, and it, it needs a whole lot of polishing to make it decent, or you're buying it from the fastidious owner who had this thing for 15 years, perfected it, tweaked it, upgraded it. And that was all the joy. And you won't know until you meet talk to and spend some time with the owner so i would totally recommend that that's the only way this car should be bought probably not blindly over the internet 
fair, Dave? Or are you going to? I I couldn't agree more, Larry. Yeah. For, for once, you're talking sense. So uh, <laughs> I mean, how, how'd that happen? I don't know, but I'm going to remember this day. Uh, what about you? <laughs> Hey, um, how about a 2004 Volkswagen R32, um, also on Bring a Trailer? Uh, it's at $6,666, the devil you say. I don't get uh, these cars at all, Dave. I'm going to stay it right off. I, I never understood these things. T- tell me why I'm wrong. I, you know, basically, you can call it kind of the last of the analogs in some ways. It's a mm. you know, VR6 with a manual transmission. Uh, we got the top sale on one of these we found in uh, 2020 at $62,000. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. uh, that's not chump change. Um, but I, I think it's a very much a specialty car, but I think it's got a lot of future. Uh, you know, six-speed manual, uh, four-motion all-wheel drive. This is deep, uh, deep blue pearl paint, uh, black leather, power okay. sunroof, which some people wouldn't want. It's got the window sticker. It's a numbered R. It's got a number R32 poster, okay. man. Just, just hear my diatribe on this. The okay. GTI, Ready? that this car is supposed to be the ultimate GTI. The GTI was a hot rod version of an economy hatchback. And you know the story. Volkswagen did the first one in the 70s in Europe. They brought it here in 1983 with the Volkswagen GTI that was actually built in Pennsylvania. Yep. And they, Westmoreland, PA. Yeah, they were, at the time, they were quicker to 60 than a Trans Am. And yep. that that that's a that's a pretty good illustration of the dark times of the early '80s. But <laughs> they were super fun to drive, super light. I owned one. I've had two GTIs. I freaking I've actually I've had three. Love these cars. The R32. I get it. It's the most outrageous version you could get. But once you throw in four wheel drive, you've changed the character. You've added weight. You could also this car. I think this uh, 04 version is the last one without a turbo. It has that really neat VR6 engine, which is a a V6 of a narrow angle between the cylinder banks. So it actually uses one cylinder head, which is super cool. I get it. I get it. I get it. But even when they were new and I was at car and driver at the time driving these things, I was like, oh my gosh, double the price of a regular GTI and I'm not having double the fun. But I guess there is a per- percentage of folks that always want the best. And maybe that's what this is. The best well, GTI. It- yeah, this isn't the best of the best. I mean, it's a 155,000 mile car. So I okay, don't think this it's going to do any. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to do any sixty-two grand. It's also got some paintwork uh, that's been done on the car and some other things. But it seems like a pretty clean car. Uh, yeah. You know, let's just wait and see what this thing goes for. I think it could be a buy. You know, for somebody who wants a you know a fun little uh, you know zip around car with a lot of uh, you know it's got a lot of punch to it. So what the heck, right? I don't know. I, I mean, it just it goes and like I said, I'm conflicted. I mean, I hope whoever buys it, it seems like somebody's really had a lot of fun with that many miles on it. It's just always struck me as a an odd car, but I think I'm in the minority because obviously the prices are quite strong. So, anything else? Uh, are you looking forward to seeing what happens to? You know, have you have your had your karma checked recently, Larry? It looks uh, like after what I just said about this R32, I might need it. Right, I'm a little negative energy over here. Yeah, well, you can change that by buying a 2022 Karma. GTS 6 Sport. Now, if you remember, Karma was Fisker, yep. uh, and they, they made a car uh, in this country, and uh, uh, there was a flood after a hurricane that took care of the last of them. Um, and so production has moved, and it's a new company. Their production has moved to China. And so now uh, you got a chance to buy a 2022 GS6 Sport Karma. Uh, Good-looking car. It's on Bring a Trailer again at $20,000 right now. Uh, 2,000 miles, uh, dual rear-mounted electric motors. Uh, and yes, it is all electric. They always have been, except for the ones no. that uh, max, Maximum no, Bob no, Lutz No, the first ones made. were hybrids. That, you're right. You're right. But Maximum Bob Lutz also dropped the uh, small block in it. He did. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, these cars are you know good package to, uh, to change things around. And these things look really good. Uh-oh. And uh, mm-hmm. not being a fan of the current look of the Tesla, I think this is a uh, a reasonable car to uh, to look into. Or you think I'm wrong I, again, I, right? Well, Dave, we have to speak about one of your weird obsessions. And you're one of the strange... And this car is just like the Avanti, right? What have you owned? You said you had like 200 Avantis. You own 20 of them right now. It's like... I'm going to plead the fifth here. <laughs> that is the car that has... The Studebaker Avanti has, has destroyed more fortunes than any other car in the history of the automotive world. Because... It was new. It's a really uh, polarizing, interesting, fresh design. And I think there's been at least six different 
people or companies that have bought the design and tried to relaunch making the car only to lose their shirt and then go on and sell it. It, it may be you know, six it's, or it's the same old thing. How to, how to make five million in the car business start with 50 million. I get it. So I know, yeah. but everybody knows that, but everybody thinks the Avanti is, is the path to riches because it's this, you know, to some subset of people, it hits this incredibly passionate core. And I think the Fisker karma is the exact same thing because as you said, it came out. Henrik Fisker is a super talented designer who worked at BMW and Aston. This was his first car. It used an Ecotec four cylinder in a series hybrid where that thing only was like a generator and charged the electric motors. Then, yeah, your point, it's such a beautiful car. When that went out of business, Bob Lutz was like, yeah, I'm going to put a Corvette powertrain in this thing. We all thought that was going to be awesome because it's a beautiful four cylinder. That didn't go right. That didn't make it. And now we have a third company that's bought the design in China and has now made an all electric version. It's fascinating. Three companies on one design. Henrik knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Yeah, and he's you know back in business again, obviously. So they're about to go in production with a you know like an SUV, a small SUV. Um, uh, but oh, right. yeah, I mean the guy around, he knows what he's doing. He's a smart guy. I like the design of it. It's it yeah okay. It's beautiful. Uh, yeah. You know, and I get it. I mean, maybe not buying a car that's a limited production company like this, and maybe you will find yourself in the Avanti land of uh, of uh, you know having to uh, you know uh, explain it to everybody. But in the meantime. <laughs> Uh, I kind of like it, you know, what the hell, it, you know, my money, my rules, I'm not buying it, but it would be my money, my rules. So no, I, I just love that some of these designs, uh, occur or are introduced that really, uh, they speak to people in a hugely strong way yep. and, and they feel like so passionate about it that they think, well, there must be a massive market of people who share my passion. And I guess the karma is another one, like your Avanti, which I think. All those investments, Dave, are going to pay off. You're going to be fine. I yeah, mean, you're going to thanks. be buying G5s off of those things pretty soon. So you says, just hang in there. Okay? Says the man who pretty much invented buying high and selling low. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's, that's fine. That's why I had to start this podcast, Dave. You got to <laughs> teach me. I'm an idiot. Um, I, I think I think we got a couple of idiots in charge here. So <laughs> that's uh, it's kind of a problem. But, you know, the other thing you should, uh, you know, we should, should say is the karma is also one of those cars that's off-putting to a lot of people. A lot of people think it's ugly as hell. Oh, and, they do. I, and, and, I mean, I get that. And, you know, that's true with a lot of cars because it's a, you know, I'm not going to call it a breakthrough design. It's kind of an odd design, but it's, a, you know, a four door that looks like a sports car, which is always kind of hard to pull off. So, uh, you know, whatever. Well, the biggest news for us this week is today on Wednesday was the first day of the Haggerty Marketplace auctions. And it's at, uh, you can go to Haggerty.com. You can go right to them. There is a 2019 Ford GT for sale right now. It's got a week. This thing's already at half a million bucks. Yep. This is such a cool color. It's it's white. It's got massive wheels. It, it, I have not seen this this uh, color combination with the wheels and stuff like that. I freaking love it. I know these things, we've been watching them. They're selling around a million bucks, give or take. Is that fair? I mean, this one doesn't have a ton of miles, 7,000 miles. Yeah, and I think Ford's already announced that they're not going to make any more of them. So that's uh, right. you know instant collectible status, which is not surprising. Um, you know, the, the last gen, the 2005, 2006 GT, very, very popular. Um, the, uh, you know, these cars were hard to get. You had to basically prove to Ford that you were worthy, uh, you know, in the beginning, especially that's why dead mouse got one and I didn't. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm not bitter, not bitter at all, but anyhow, I got one too, Dave. I'm sorry. I did. uh, I guess, you know, almost everybody I know got one, but I guess I'm, (laughs) uh, you know, pick glass at basketball. I get it. You know, it's, it's the story of my life, but anyhow, um, yeah, you know, a lot of people bought them and, and, uh, tried to turn them Ford made you sell a, I made, made you sign a, you know, a non-sale, uh, disclosure for what, for two years or something like that. You couldn't, uh, couldn't sell them. So now a lot of them are coming on the market unbelievable supercar the car that ford should have uh, kind of never dabbled in and they did twice and good for them because uh, it's a you know it's a halo car it's a, a car that kind of defines part of the brand uh not a big money maker i'm sure but uh, uh it will be for the secondary market i uh, it's, it's a fascinating i mean as an investment potential it's it's super confusing they made over a thousand of them they never announced how many they were going to make right so they weren't exactly limited. All, you know, you look at, you could compare it to maybe an F40 where they made a thousand of those and they seem to keep appreciating. On the other hand, in the Ford GT's camp, 
I don't know. I still, this is like one of the most amazing stories that I don't think has been really properly told. There's a couple of books out on it, but they're not really that good. In 2016, 60 or uh, 50 years after Ford beat Ferrari with the GT40, they went back with this car and they won again. I mean, God, conspiracy theorists must go crazy with that result. But still, <laughs> you know, this guy has got street cred out the wazoo because it was basically built to homologate for racing. And that's why it has all this crazy aero stuff on it. The, the passenger compartment is tiny. There is no trunk. This is a race car. Yeah. But it actually went and raced and it won. Yeah, but it's actually uh, easy to drive and easy to handle. Have you noticed? Uh, did you notice that? I mean, the the controls are make sense and it's not like a you know crazy lack of creature comfort car. It's just not a big car inside. It's a big car on the outside. But I think that uh, you know a lot of people are surprised with how well they uh, you know they, they kind of I'm not going to say. Of course, they handle well. They're they're basically a race car, but uh, um, that they they're easy to live with. Maybe that's what I should say. I you know I tell you I drove the, one of the race cars at VIR, and they're been driving different race cars for 30 years now. And now these these purpose built sports cars they're getting so um, numb. I really couldn't tell what the car was doing. I had very little brake pedal feel. It was hard as a rock. And I went back and I said to the engineers, I can't tell. Did I lock a wheel? Did I do this? And they said, oh, oh, right, right. There are these little lights on the front corners <laughs> that tell you if you locked a wheel. And it would light up. You're like, oh, I've locked a wheel, which I thought was freaking fascinating how the drivers are adapting to these cars that really, they, it felt like a video game is what I walked away with. Yeah, like, and just like in video history. games, nobody reads the manual, so they never know what all the lights stand for anyway. So, right? And just like a video game, I'm too old to be playing, maybe, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both, brother. You and me both. Well, I'd be interested to see how that works. <laughs> Check out the Haggerty Marketplace. There's a bunch of other cool cars, in including a really, really clean um, Chevy pickup from the 70s, which I like. But let's move on to the question section. Mike from Aptos, California, he wants to know if it's wise to look for cars that come up for sale at a land-based auction that run early or late on the docket. So he's looking for a deal. Dave, if you go to an auction, you're in person. You want the cars that are like first in line or the ones last in line? Are those where the deals are? Yeah, sometimes. Um, <clears throat> you know, mm. what's, what's happened is that, you know, everyone bids on the internet. Everyone has uh, live bidding on the internet, even at a, you know, a stationary auction. Almost everybody does. So those days of maybe, you know, waiting till midnight to buy the snag, the last three or four cars are kind of, gone uh because oh. it's not midnight in everybody's uh time zone and the other thing right. is that the early cars tend to be uh, you know not always but they tend to be kind of lesser cars uh and you know that doesn't always hold true so in other words they'll run to run through the uh the six and ten thousand dollar cars uh doesn't mean that there's nothing wrong with, i mean it doesn't mean there's nothing wrong let's try that again there's nothing wrong with buying a six or ten thousand dollar car it's just that you're not going to find a uh, superstar you know, a lot of the times early on in the auction. So, and the same is true for, you know, if it's a four day auction starts on Thursday or uh, Wednesday or something like that, the Wednesday cars are not going to be the, uh, the, the prime cuts. So, right. um, so from, from that standpoint, yeah, there is a little bit of said, uh, little to be said by that, uh, or said for that, that people sometimes, uh, make a buy because they're there early or they're late. I would say you're better off early when nobody's used to bidding. Uh, you might uh, snag something early because you know, it's the first car that goes through or the second car that goes through, and the rhythm of the auction has not been uh, you know established at that. Hmm. So in the previous time, when everybody's still getting their popcorn, you might be able to snag a car with few other bidders in the right. room is getting I mean. their auction juice you mean mm -hmm. which of course is uh stuff that's federally licensed and sold <laughs> as alcohol in other places but yeah exactly ah yes i heard it okay we're gonna put you on the spot mm. here are you ready, ready dave joe from west branch michigan this is a question on a lot of our minds since my stocks are tanking should i just pull out 50 grand and buy a car no no, he didn't even give you a nope. minute. Why not? What are you talking about? We're just looking at all these things trading for crazy well, money. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, investment versus fun. Uh, cars shouldn't be your number one investment unless you're in the car business. Um, you know, I mean, stocks go up, stocks go down. I, I think that over time, if you have a mixed market basket of stocks, you're better off staying in the stock market. However, um, you know, grandma dies and leaves you $50,000. That's a different story. 
Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I would say get in with your fund money. Don't take all your stocks. Uh, don't take everything out of stocks. Uh, you know, I mean, if you really have a feel for it, if you really think you can make the money, go for it. But for most people, 10 percent, Dave. Uh, 10% of our 401k and cars? 10% works. Think? Yeah, absolutely. Just like 10% would okay. work in gold okay. or silver or something like that. You know, why not? Right. Yeah, why not? Right. So, but I don't think they, I mean, I don't know. What, Does, what would you buy with this hypothetical 50 grand, Dave? Jeez. <laughs> uh, you know me, I'd probably buy more Avani's. Uh, I'd probably buy an R32. Yeah, right. Exactly. No, now, I, you know, right now, um, I don't know what I would buy right now. I, it's a little bit of a tricky market. I think we're heading into a, a trickier market coming up. I will tell you that quality always sells. So if you find wow. something, unless you find a fantastic example of it, uh, you know this is not the time to be buying a number three car unless you're buying it for the fun factor and you're good at fixing it yourself. Now's the time to focus in on that $50,000 car that's damn near perfect. I think I'd buy a fleet of Miatas for me and my buddies to go road trip on. So like five, right? We just saw this. Holy yeah. Road and road. yeah, no problem at all. Cause five times the insurance, five times the licensing cost, uh, you know, whatever, no problem. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's an easy one. Well, you know, I, yeah. I, okay. Joe, best of luck, <laughs> Dave. Any, uh, that's it for me. You got any closing comments you want to make? Yeah. I, you know, I'm going to double down on what I said earlier, go to an auction, you know, uh, get off your butt and, and go to a live auction then. And then in the next one. few months, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a couple coming up that uh, are going to be fun. Um, we've got December sales, November sales, and uh, so January sales. Uh, there's nothing like it. And if you can't get to a car auction, just go to a farm sale, go to a, a house sale, something like that. It's so much fun watching what stuff sells for. It's so much fun watching the interaction with people. So uh, that, that's my advice for everybody. Just have. No, I think that. That's super interesting. So it's like watching a market being made in real time. Yeah, exactly. Right? And uh, I mean, you know, you can have as much fun when you're seeing them sell five dollar stuff as you see selling five thousand dollar stuff because you know the personalities involved, the auction caller, you know, all that sort of stuff. And you know, you, you're going to meet some some very interesting people who are auction regulars of all kinds. So, uh, and by interesting, I mean weird because I'm one of them. So there you are. <laughs> Well, economics is really the study of humanity. And what you're just saying there is going to an auction, you're seeing humanity operating live for all its rational, irrational, interconnected messiness that makes it such a, you know, makes our lives so rich. Yep. I think. Did I put that in a nice I, I did, but you if do? you want rational, don't get involved in the stock market. Go, don't go to auction. So uh, <laughs> ra rationality just left the room. So uh Oh, I, God, that's such a great tip. I'm going to try and take you up on that. And it's so much easier to find out where these auctions are. I'm going to have to attend one. So thank sure. you for that. Well, that was it for me. Please subscribe if you like this. I hope you do. We want to hear from you. Uh, you can subscribe at Spotify, Apple, iTunes, and of course, through YouTube. And please let us know what you think and leave your questions in the comments. Catch you next week on No Reserve.